So why checkpoint restore? The first and the most obvious reason would be that we're all human, we all make mistakes, somebody pushes a commit and then boom, dev is down. So software breaks all the time and for you to be able to checkpoint uh, your environments consistently, uh, regularly, lets you bring them back up immediately in the case of any downtime. I'll be talking about Checkpoint and Restore uh, in Kubernetes with Crew. So firstly, let's, let's get who I am out of the way. Uh, I'm Prajwal, uh, currently a Rust engineer at DeepSource, and I completed my Google Summer of Code in 2022 with Crew, which is why I picked this as the topic of today's talk. So generally, the first question I get whenever I bring up the word Crew is that, is this similar to Crew? So the peop for the people who are familiar with Kubernetes, you might have heard of Crew. It's uh, a pretty popular container runtime. So uh, Creo is an OCI compliant uh, implementation of the Kubernetes CRI, uh, which is basically a standard that Kubernetes uses uh, for you to be able to plug and play any uh, container runtime along with it. Creo is a Linux tool that lets you uh, basically take a process, any process that runs on Linux, and write it to a bunch of files on disk. So you can statefully capture a process and then restore it in the same state later on. And the best part about it is that you are not restricted to doing this on the same system that you get the files from. So you can take a process from one system, checkpoint it to a bunch of files, and restore that on a different system. So in the context of Kubernetes, you can move processes across nodes using this. So why checkpoint restore? The first and the most obvious reason would be that we're all human, we all make mistakes, somebody pushes a commit and then boom, dev is down. So software breaks all the time and for you to be able to checkpoint uh, your environments consistently, uh, regularly, lets you bring them back up immediately in the case of any downtime. So you don't have to wait on other people for something that's borked to be fixed. You can straight up just spin up the previous checkpoint and you're all good to go. And backups are hard, again, uh, many times you will have certain stateful parts, so databases, for example, are a great uh, scenario for this. Backing up the state of a database, like let's say you're midway through a transaction and something goes down. So uh, Checkpoint Restore can let you save the state of the part before you're doing the transaction and at every stage in the transaction. So something dies, you just spin it back up from where it died and you can restart the process or you can continue from where you left off. Uh, Another use case would be long startup times. Uh, there are a lot of services, a lot of different kinds of uh, applications you'll run which would need to be warmed up before. So you'll have to do health checks, you know, uh, initialize a cache, a bunch of other stuff. And you wouldn't want to do this every time, especially if nothing is changing between uh, you initializing these uh, applications. So using checkpointing, you warm something up, you initialize the cache and create a checkpoint. And then next time, you can just kickstart your process from there. You don't have to wait uh, to do the entire rigmarole that you did the previous time. And reproducible state. So that's the biggest benefit of Checkpoint and Restore. You have a cluster, and you want to move it from a set of four nodes to four other nodes. You can straight up checkpoint all four of these nodes, move the files to the new set of nodes, and restore it. And you're going to get ditto, the exact same replica that was running previously on this uh, new cluster. So the principle behind Checkpoint and Restore is very, very straightforward. Uh, you take a process and you identify every resource associated to it. So that can be everything from you know, the files that it's reading and writing, open file descriptors, uh, TCP connections, memory maps, uh, specific memory locations that it's using, and other processes that, it's, processes that it's interacting with. So you capture all of this and you just write it to a set of files. Uh, literally just stream all of this data to a set of binary files, and then you can restore the process in the same state from the set of files. And the catch is that this need not work all the time. Uh, there are many features that are not always consistent. They may be platform specific, they may be application specific. So in those cases, if you're not careful, you can kill something. And yeah, you might have to end up explaining why dev is down when you try this at your <laughs> production cluster. So. Coming to Creo as a specific tool, so there are multiple tools available today for performing checkpoint and restore. 
uh, but Crew is uh, accepted as the most working version as of now. Uh, it works currently only on Linux, but it provides support for most scenarios. Uh, there are very few cases where Crew does not work with Checkpoint and Restore. And it uses protobuf to encode the data of your process. So basically, you will have uh, multiple image files. They're called images, these binary files. And you have different files for each type of data that you're checkpointing. So you have one for memory locations. You have one for your TCP connections. You have one for the file descriptors, and so on and so forth. And uh, Creo also has a separate uh, you know, specific custom option that's defined for the protobuf files. So in case you want to attach any metadata to what is being checkpointed, you can hook into that with your own custom proto definitions and add that to the checkpoint. So in the uh, context of Kubernetes, why is checkpoint and restore hard? So uh, since the concept was already explained, this seems pretty straightforward. You know, you take a process, write it to disk, restore it. It's, it's not that big of a deal. So this is a typical structure of a Kubernetes node. So every node has a kubelet, which is the node agent. And the kubelet interacts with a high-level container runtime that is generally container D or Creo. And that, in turn, uh, talks to a low-level container runtime, which is usually run C. Now, whenever you want to uh, create a, a container here, so you pass the request to the Kubernetes API. That API uh, is interpreted by the kubelet. It passes on the request to the high-level runtime. That passes it on to the low-level runtime. And that actually spawns the process. So the problem with checkpoint and restore is that you need to consistently add this feature in at every level of this hierarchy. And you need to also be able to provide a consistent API for each of these layers to interact with each other. So Creo is a binary that is shipped by default with uh, Ubuntu. So if you're using the Ubuntu image for deploying your uh, services, then it's going to be shipped by default. And of course, it's available as a binary for all the other platforms too. But Run C is going to invoke Creo. And you need containerd to call runc and tell that to runc. And you need the kubelet to tell that to containerd. And then you need a Kubernetes API that the end user can call saying, hey, I want to checkpoint this particular part, or I want to checkpoint this particular node, entire node. And as you can expect, that's a lot of work, uh, especially considering how quickly things change in the DevOps landscape. You know, things are working one day, and in the next version, it's just been deprecated, or they've nuked the whole implementation and written it from scratch all over again. So, What's the current state of support uh, for Checkpoint and Restore? Creo as a project was uh, you know, conceptualized in late 2014, uh, somewhere towards the start of 2015. And right uh, once the project was in a working state, uh, support was added for RunC and LXC, uh, closely followed by Docker. And Containerd and Podman were added in the subsequent years, but Kubernetes was the real challenge to integrate along with this. And after four years of effort, so the Kubernetes integration started in 2018 uh, with the KEP. And across four years, it's uh, finally been implemented. And uh, it's available as an alpha feature today in v1.25. So for you to be able to use this today with Kubernetes, uh, firstly, you've got to enable the container checkpoint feature flag. Uh, and after the feature flag is enabled, you will have to configure your high-level container runtime to uh, enable checkpointing and restoring. So there are two flags, okay, enable CRIU support for checkpointing. And you need to explicitly instruct the runtime to not drop the infra container uh, when you're restoring it. So for that, you need the second flag. And yeah, there's a co standard Kubernetes API that you can access to slash checkpoint. And when you do this, uh, CRIU is going to uh, checkpoint that particular process that you want to checkpoint. And it's going to give you the file as an archive uh, at this location, you know, var slash lib slash kubelet slash checkpoints. The name is going to be a little annoying because it's going to be namespace hyphen pod hyphen container hyphen the time that you checkpointed at. So once you have this archive, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. Uh, and the restoration process is pretty straightforward. You know, you build a scratch container. So from scratch, add the star, and you can you know, spin up a pod using that image, and your process is going way back in the exact same state. So there's a bunch of cool stuff you can do with Checkpoint and Restore. Uh, the project was initially uh, conceptualized with the goal of live container migration. 
So you have a node that needs to be shut down. You don't have a choice. Something has gone wrong and you need to shut it down. And you need to migrate a running container in the same state to a new node. So you can do that with this uh, checkpoint it on the first node. Move those files. You can do that in a variety of ways. You know, rsync it across these two, SSH, any, whatever that, uh, you know, checks your boxes. And restore it on the new node. And the second thing is faster startups with state initialization. So I mentioned this even previously, you know, warm something up, set up the cache, checkpoint it. And the next time you kick started from the same place. Uh, from a security perspective, there's a couple of things that Checkpoint Restore helps out with, uh, which is uh, forensic analysis and snapshots for debugging. So you have a buggy part, and you want to figure out what exactly is wrong with it, but you don't want to do it on your production cluster because there's a chance that you know it'll kill probably something else. Your errors will propagate. So you can checkpoint this and restore it inside a sandbox. The container is not going to know what's happening. The container still uh, thinks that it's running in the same environment it previously was in. But you are now running it in a sandbox where you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can pen test it. You can you know, throw random junk data at it and see how it responds. Uh, there's just uh, no limits to uh, how you can use this. And the last use case that's uh, interesting would be dry runs of updates. So if you're doing major updates to your cluster, let's say you're bumping up a kernel version, there's a pretty high chance something is going to die. So one thing you can do, checkpoint the entire cluster and spin it up in you know, an alternative uh, set of nodes, maybe a spare uh, a set of nodes with lesser resources. And you run the update there, make sure nothing dies. And then you can just kill that and actually apply the update on your production system. So the advantage this gives you is that uh, you're never performing an update without knowing the implications of what's going to happen. Uh, you're always going to be aware, and you can say that you've always done one round of testing with the updates and made sure that nothing breaks. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Let, let's go on that one. Right, so checkpoint and restore as a concept is dicey because uh, the environment where you're applying this is need not be consistent. So the checkpoint and restore is guaranteed to work only as long as the scenario in which you're running it and the context in which you're doing this it remains identical. If you perform the checkpoint on, like, say, an x64 system and you restore it on a different x64 system, there's a reasonable guarantee it'll work. But the moment you try to move things cross-platform, cross-OS, that is where there's a pretty high chance that things will break. Yeah, you, you can configure the checkpoint to be uh, you know, written to any destination you want. Uh, typically, it's written to the file system on which you're running it. But you might as well give an, you know, an SSH path, or you can give an rsync path to a remote system and say, hey, write it to this location on this system. So that's going to work uh, as usual. Yeah. No, no, so while you're checkpointing the process, if it is already accessing any files, so if uh, generally most databases write to a set of, they'll have a directory where they'll have a set of files and indexes that they use. So only the one that is open during the checkpoint is going to be uh, captured and processed. The other files that are not being used at that time, they're not going to be captured. So if you have associated data that's not actively in use, you'll have to migrate that yourself. If the volume is in use, it's going to be migrated. But if it's not in use, you'll have to migrate it yourself. Right. No more questions? Thank you. <laughs>